So thank you, Jonathan, for that introduction. Um, and thank you, everyone, for being here with us today. Um, so as Jonathan mentioned, my name is Neda. I'm an experienced designer. I'm based here in Dubai for the most part, sometimes in between Canada and the UK when we don't have travel restrictions upon us. Um, so I started my career in UX back in 2007 in Canada, and I moved to Dubai in about 2010, where I've been consulting in digital and UX design since. Um, so I own my own UX, uh, boutique UX consultancy, and I also head up the product UX and CX for a new startup in the UAE, yeah, which is a digital mobile banking application. So what I was hoping to do with you guys today is share the learnings that I've gained over the past two years working with YAP that has opened up my eyes to a whole new world out there that will impact each and every one of us in the near future. So let's get started with that. Okay, so if I was, um, I think I've already sort of asked you guys all to, in the comment box to sort of tell it, uh, just uh, say if you're coming from the banking industry or the FinTech industry, um, it'd be really interesting for me to know afterwards just how many people have joined um, and some which industry they're in and sort of their background. So if you don't mind just commenting in the comment section, that would be great. So FinTech. Okay, guys, FinTech is not a buzzword. <laughs> FinTech is an industry that digitizes banking for all of humanity. Did you guys know that two thirds of the world's population are financially excluded, meaning that they're still cash based? And those are for many different reasons and challenges, which I'm not really gonna go through today, but the point is FinTechs are popping up all over the world because they see this as an opportunity to bring financial inclusion for all of humanity through digitization of financial networks. And of course, in order to digitize financial networks for humanity, we need human-centered designers and UX designers to ensure that we're designing for humanity. So um, today, I'm gonna talk you guys through the UX journey that I've gone through and I'm still going through with a company called Yap. So Yap is a new mobile-only banking application um, that should have actually launched this month in beta. Um, however, of course, due to the corona times that we're all in today, the company took the decision to wait just until things have settled a little bit to go into beta live. But for the past two years, I've been working with an incredible team to bring this product to life. And at the center of everything that we have been doing, there has been a focus on the experience of the app. User experience, customer experience, data experience, simply the best possible experience that we can give to our users. And this really isn't an easy thing to do, especially when it comes to banking, because of regulations and requirements from central bank and info security. There's many journeys along the way that we discovered were innately frustrating. And I'm sure all of you joining us today that work in financial services can probably attest to that. What I'm planning to do with you today is go through some of the techniques that we employ that have become part of everything we do um, when it comes to designing experiences within our product in the hopes that some of you can use these techniques in the products that you're also designing. So to start, I wanted to share this quote with you guys. Um, some of you, you've probably heard this before, it's from Tom Godwin and he points out that Uber, the world's largest taxi company, owns no vehicles. Facebook, the world's most popular media owner, creates no content. Alibaba, the most valuable retailer, has no inventory. And Airbnb, the world's largest accommodation provider, owns no real estate. Something interesting is happening. And indeed, something interesting is happening, especially if we take a look at what's happening these days just with the whole uh, coronavirus and COVID-19 crisis that has forced people and industries and businesses to think digital. Every industry has the opportunity to be disrupted through technology, and banking is also one of them. Now, there's a difference between having banks provide online banking or a mobile bank to support their current networks, and new banks, which are also known as neo banks or challenger banks in the fintech arena, that are coming and changing the way banking services work. Now I'm gonna say a couple things that might get people who work in banks a little bit, you know, I don't know, might, might stir some thoughts, but um, now more than ever, because of what we're going through, digitization of an industry like banking is essential. 
Um, banks as we know them, they just cannot offer fully digitized solutions. Banks are legacy monolith firms that like to control everything. And I say that with all due respect to banks. They just can't help it. They have internal structures that are proprietary and built on legacy systems. They love to keep customers locked in to an end-to-end -end delivery of mediocre digital services, if you will. And therefore, they lock out third-party services and APIs who try to and try to offer everything under their own umbrellas. FinTechs are the complete opposite of every point I just made. And I know some of you may be thinking, well, no, not my bank, not the bank I bank with. They just released a really cool new app that looks great. Yes, indeed, there's a lot of banks out there that are waking up and coming up with really cool new experiences and designs. Um, which is great, and definitely I, I, I commend them for that, and hopefully they continue doing that. But what I'm referring to is their legacy back-end system. That just, they just don't cut it, especially when you want to consider new features and financial services that have never been built or never been considered in a bank. These are the things that um, banks haven't been able to offer, and even if they wanted to, might have difficulties because of these legacy systems that are in place. So this is what has been happening right now across the world. We have the, the rise of challenger banks. Um, across the globe, we see challenger banks coming and changing the, the banking industry and bringing new ideas and ways of experiencing financial services. These fintechs all serve different purposes, whether they're lending marketplaces or they're credit card focus or they're payment marketplaces. There is one thing that they truly have in common, and that is boasting a focus on user experience. So guys, UXers out there, your skills are needed. And what you bring to the table is what these players and other players similar to other industries are competing on. So it's really great news for us UXers out there. Um, and if you wanted more proof, just take a look at the two largest digital companies in the world, Apple and Google, and their endeavors into the FinTech space. Apple came out with an uh, Apple card last year um, that was released in the US. And now Google just leaked their new Google card that will be gracing our fintech space soon. So like we said, things are changing. So this was a little bit of my preamble to get you guys, to give you guys some background in the fintech industry. Um, and now I want to, want to be able to speak to you a little bit about my UX journey, working with Yap and helping them design a mobile only banking and payment solution for the UAD. So who's YAP? Um, like I mentioned, so YAP, uh, the idea of YAP started over two years ago, and it's taking us this long to get an app up and working because it's not easy building a bank. <laughs> Besides truly investing time into the full UX process and ensuring we validate everything we build, the back end of the banking system is complex to say the least. But I'm not here to talk about the technical part of the build. That's another story. I want to focus um, on the talk about what we did to create a product that is human centered. And the first thing that I'll say is that as a startup, initially, we were less than about 20 people in total working on the build of this project. And everyone, regardless if they were tech, finance, compliance, admin, content, marketing, everyone became part of the product team at some point meaning our product was being validated by different team members across the business with know-how in different areas of the business. And this was overseen directly by the CEO of Yap, who was part of all the UX conversations. So because of the dynamic we worked in, we had to ensure that there was a common understanding of the product that we were trying to build and that UX had the authority to drive the design decisions of the product offering. This was also supported completely by our CEO, who made sure that UX was part of every decision taken that impacted the business and the product. And that was one of the most amazing things working in a fintech startup because we had that support from the leadership, at, and they were actually and it actually involved at the granular level and that level of making these decisions, which really really helped in building this collaborative product team. Um, and so this was all leadership when I say CEO, CTO, everyone that really, everyone really got involved at the, at the granular level of the product that we were trying to build. So Good we question. need to, yes. How big is this startup and like how, 
how was it growing? Like how uh, aggressively was it growing or has been? Yeah, so I think now we're going to be growing aggressively. Um, but in the past two years, when it was just an idea coming together, we were actually very small. Like I mentioned, we were about less than 20 people. Um, and to, to date, we're still quite a small team, which really helps. I understand when you're dealing with big banks, you have so many people involved and it's very difficult to get things changed and get things moving because of the size of your business. But as a startup, this is, was one of our advantages. Um, and I do believe that a lot of fintechs can attest to that when they're first starting to get up off the ground is having that small close knit team that is, um, you know, experts, everyone is an expert at everything that they do and also having the capability of being, getting that sort of leadership directly from the CEO and uh, other, uh, other C-levels um, uh, within the company. We've got another interesting question. That's great. Thank you, Nada. Um, yeah, not sure. Feel free if you, if you can't sure. answer this one. Um, yeah. May we know what would be an approximate cost range for developing a challenger bank startup like Yap? Well, I, I don't actually have the answer to that. There is, um, I'm sure there's uh, lots of CapEx that you'd need to sort of get this uh, up and running. Um, let me talk to you first of all a little bit about Yap so you understand what the product entails. Um, obviously, fintechs, with, depending on the type of services they're trying to offer, there'll be different costs associated to it. But I can't sit here and quote you guys on costs um, because there's just so many different elements that go into the design and development of, uh, of a fintech solution, a payment solution, a banking solution, that cost can really range from something small to something big depending on what you're trying to do and how much you're willing to invest as well. So. Um, any questions on financials, I won't be able to really answer. So just putting that out there right now. Cool, noted. Okay, all right. So, um, so talking about this collaborative product design team, what we needed to do to sort of get everyone together and get everybody on the same page um, is we wanted to ensure that there was a company-wide agreed upon product goal to set the stage. So we had what I like to call a product mantra. Well, we not had, what we actually had. Um, and that is to find opportunities and unmet customer banking needs to create a breakthrough agile product that is infused with innovation and designed to build the best user and customer experience in the market. So imagine already just our product mantra that every single person within the company is thinking about uses the word user and customer experience. So this really just shows how everyone at Yap had to think um, and that anyone that touches the product or has any influence, whether it's from strategy, financials, design, marketing development, everyone had the sort of understanding that we are trying to build an, a product that has an amazing user experience. And trust me, this mantra really helped us solve a lot of issues and win a lot of wars when it came to product strategy and product design. So the first, that's one of the first techniques that we employ is ensuring that you have a goal that's in place that is pushed down from top, uh, top down to everyone in the organization um, that sort of encourages um, focus on experience. Secondly, know your customer and validate their needs. KYC. For the bankers in the Zoom, you're all aware of the infamous KYC. And for the non-bankers, basically, these are the regulatory pieces of information that a bank must know about a customer in order to be able to issue them an account. Well, at Yap, when I say KYC, we think a little bit differently. It's about ensuring that we have a strong understanding of who our customers are, so that we center them into the build of our product. And to do this, we employ different methods of research at different stages of the design process. Um, so far, in, in, the, in the two years that I've been with the app already, we've conducted one-on-one -on -one user interviews. We worked with a research firm to gain market intelligence. We sent out surveys. We visited customers and observed them, um, especially our, our business customers. Um, we held focus group sessions. We basically did everything we could to learn about our users and understand how to build this really strong, intimate relationship with our target audiences. So user research is crucial at any stage in product development. And obviously I'm preaching to the crowd because there's a lot of UXers here, but I just wanna sort of bring that point and I'll talk a little bit more about it because 
Um, you know, especially when it comes to a service like banking, a lot of us think, well, I'm a banking customer. I know what banks, banking customers need. Um, I've been a banking customer for years. I know what I need. And so you kind of always end up getting people's opinions come into play based on their own experiences. So this is, especially in this industry, user research is so important if you're trying to push through or validate specific products, um, elements of the product, because it needs to always go back to who you guys have thought about as your target audiences. And also just to note that this is also an ongoing practice. We will be talking, we will continue to be talking to our customers and learning about their needs, their pain points, getting feedback on them from our product. Um, so user research has really become ingrained uh, in the product design methodology that we have. So yeah, we've just got a couple of questions, sorry. Yeah, sure. um, Going back a hey. step, um, yeah, sorry, if you don't mind, we, we're, uh, Linda, if you just type your, your question in the chat, I'm just going to be moderating um, the questions because some people are, are, are typing them privately and I'm just trying to coordinate yeah. um, it all. Thank you. Um, so just going back a couple of slides around your yeah. statement. Um, yes. One of the questions was, it seems quite broad. Um, and how, how did you create this? Like, how did the team, how did you come up with this? And Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, the comment was, it just, it seems broad. Um, yeah, it is, I guess it is broad, um, and that's okay. I mean, within each of our teams, we will have a little bit more specific goals and objectives, like within the UX team and the product teams, we'll have our more specific goals and objectives of different things that we're trying to do when it comes to different journeys that we're trying to develop. But when we're trying to get sort of everybody um, on board in terms of the organization, having a broad mantra isn't something, isn't, isn't a bad thing because it sort of just at least allows everyone to remember that what we're trying to build here has to ensure that there's customers at the center of what we're doing. Um, and so, yes, there are many other different objectives and goals that are in place, but just having something that's, that's quite broad in general that all different departments can easily understand worked for us. So again, it might depend, it might be different for different organizations, but this is the one that we have been using. We use it in all our decks. We use it when we talk to our investors um, and everyone sort of just gets the point that what we're trying to do is ensure that all the sort of different ideas, innovative ideas that we want to bring in to our product have to be infused with customer experience and user experience. Yeah, great. That, that, that makes a lot of sense, like your, your, your war cry. Um, yeah. an, another question was in terms of research, Yeah. Uh, what methods did you use? Did you hire an agency? Did you do it yourself? Yeah. Did you go into a coffee mm -hmm. shop? Could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, yeah, definitely. So like I mentioned, we've used a lot of different methods and of course they were all needed at different parts of the, um, of the process of where we were in. Um, we uh, conducted one-on-one -on -one interviews um, with uh, different types of target audiences, especially when we're trying to create the personas, which is a screen that I'll talk about in the next slide. Um, but having those one-on-one -on -one interviews really helped us uh, think about who our users are, their pain points, um, having like in-depth conversations with them. And that was all done internally. Um, we didn't consult with an agency for that. Market research, we had hired an agency to help us collect some market research information. And we also have someone internally that works at, at YAP that is sort of the go-to person for anything to do with innovation, anything to do with what's happening in the market. I think he's here today, Anthony, who's listening in. Um, so he uh, definitely was part of uh, helping really push through our understanding of um, what's happening in the, in the region. Um, and then uh, we conduct surveys across different time uh, throughout the process, especially whenever we were trying to like have an agreement on a specific design or, you know, um, one of the things that we do is we have um, visual cards uh, that we're gonna have for different types of customers. Um, so surveys were really easy for us to get out and help us validate opinions um, really quickly. And that was also done internally. Um, field research is one of the things that I did um, First of all, uh, I, user research is something that's very important to me. I've been doing it for many, many years. So that's something I took on myself as well. And um, for example, with our when we were thinking about our B2B customers, we actually had to go in um, and visit different types of businesses, sit with them, talk to them, try to really understand how they do banking. Um, and so that's what I call field research there. 
We've conducted focus group sessions as, as well internally along with the marketing and branding teams. Um, again, we're a small company. So just because somebody's in marketing or branding doesn't mean they don't come and get involved in products. And similarly, just because you know, I'm in product, it doesn't mean I don't get involved in marketing. Everyone sort of within the organization came together um, at different stages to help us do and conduct these uh, these different um, research methods. Um, of course, you know, as soon as we get bigger and we have a lot more different research uh, needing to take place, we'll probably have to to grow that. But our team, our UX team, is growing right now. We've recently hired someone new who's joined us as well, who's gonna who's been helping us a lot um, with thinking about user research and you know. So yeah, we we kind of do it all. We try to do as much as we can in house. Whatever we can do in house, we try to involve the right agencies and companies to help us. Cool. We, we've got, sorry, before I keep going, we've got a really great question. It's, it's okay. a classic design question. I've been faced with it. Um, it'd be interesting to see uh, your take. Um, okay. I'm just going to kind of uh, translate the question a little bit. Um, how do you create innovative products from surveys and research that both might lead customers to just requesting what they already have, but just yeah. uh faster version or a slightly better version? How do you truly innovate in design? Yeah, so I, I wouldn't say that we would ever innovate in design from surveys. Um, definitely that's not, that's not what surveys are used for, not for, not, not in, in, for what we've been using it for. Definitely surveys were, not, were never used to innovate or think up of new ideas. Innovation for us came from in-depth market analysis to understand What's happening currently in the market? Um, what's the pain points that are currently happening in the region that we're focused on? So for example, in the UAE, taking a look at the FinTech space, having a very good understanding of it, knowing what's missing based on pain points that we hear from uh, our customers, and then coming up in a collaborative sort of in, uh, product environment to understand what are the different products that can be used to help solve um, some of these pain points in an innovative ways by thinking about some of the big trends that are out there. Can we use things like blockchain? Can we use things like AI? Can we use things like augmented reality and VR? Those are all things that we know is happening within the technical the technical industry that we see fintechs across the world looking into and employing. So they're all things that are on our mind. We have very good understanding of how it works. So always going to be somebody internally and the company that will have sort of the detail on that and be pushing further research and understanding of it. And then when we come back to our pain points, understanding pain points from our customers, we can start to sort of see how are we solving those pain points and can we use some of these um, technological uh, new advancements out there to solve them. So innovation, the idea sort of comes from sort of sort of looking at these things but then of course you need to go back and test does this actually work is this is this going to actually solve people's um, uh, problems is it even technically feasible so there's a lot of different you know pieces of the puzzle that go together um, and uh, the question I guess is very big um, and probably requires its own sort of pre presentation to sort of go through and sort of dissect but just as a quick answer to you yeah there's a lot more than just doing surveys and you know, checking out the market to try to come up with innovative ideas. It's a process and also it needs to be part of your sort of mindset within your business. So um, within Yap, for example, I mentioned to you guys, we have someone whose role is specific at in thinking about innovation. Um, and uh, sort of, you know, having sort of an innovation hub. I don't want to call it a hub because we're not really a hub. We're too small for that. But um, sort of a go-to person who is constantly knowing what's happening out there, doing their research, um, and validating that with our customers. That's great. Thank you. Keep cool. going. Okay, let's go on. Um, so I got to the point right now where I was talking to you guys a bit about knowing our customers and doing user research. And this helped us um, lead to creating personas. I love personas. I think personas are super, super important. Uh, I don't need to really preach them because a lot of you are here are UXers. Um, we created about 12 different personas, um, which included our tier one and tier two target audiences. 
And personas really just help us understand and empathize with our target audiences. They help us identify pain points with the current way our target audiences bank. They help us identify uh, and innovate, uh, innovative ways that we can meet their digital capacities. We always go back to them. We always, you know, refer back to our personas when we're trying to design new things or build or think of new ideas. Um, and of course, build tailored experiences at each touch point. Um, and also, Persona has really helped us think about the use cases and the journeys for each of the target audiences when we were in the initial stages of designing and building the product. Um, of course, like just so you guys know, I did not come from a banking background. Um, I've worked with banks in the past. I mean, a few years ago, I helped the bank in Turkey design their online bank with another agency. Um, so I have had banking experience in terms of user experience design, but I'm not a banker. Um, and a lot of the, a lot of my colleagues are not bankers. So for us, we really needed to get into the nitty gritty of understanding what are the use cases that these specific audiences that we're trying to target would be wanting to do or wanting to complete when uh, it came to um, to uh, building uh, a payment or mobile application for them. Um, so they're really a starting point of understanding our users, um, but. We don't want to just know who our users are. We needed to ask another question. And we needed to understand what, what our users are trying to do. So this takes me to the next piece of what, what we did. And this was really an important part of, um, of what we do. And we, we constantly are doing this. To understand what our customers are trying to do with every touch point within the product. Um, we created prof user profile canvases to help us visualize what the touch points were by thinking about what our users' tasks are, the context that they're in when they're trying to complete that task, and the influencers that they have going on during the time of completing that task. So to do so, we begin by, we begin by generating a list of tasks and context. We identify the user's goals. We think about the pains that they may be going through while trying to complete a certain task and the gains that we can achieve by, success, by having them successfully complete a task. So it kind of ends up looking something like this. This is just a small example of uh, a user profile canvas. We used Miro to create this. Um, for those of you who don't know Miro, it's an excellent collaborative whiteboarding tool that can really help you with brainstorming, creating cool UX diagrams. It's great for mapping, especially at a time like this when a lot of us are working from home and trying to manage meetings with our colleagues from home. Miro is a really great tool for collaboration and brainstorming ideas um, for UXers. So check it out. Um, but anyway, so we created this uh, canvas using Miro. And it's just a really a smaller piece of a much larger canvas um, that our team uses to identify activities, tasks, pains, and gains in relation to the journeys of our users um, that our users will be trying to complete within uh, when interacting, interacting with our app. Um, and as a financial services app, we know what are the basic features we're trying to offer. But what we needed to understand is how can our customers interact with these features in a delightful way. So um, I'm not going to go through all sort of journeys with you guys, but I'm going to talk about one that I think a lot of us can attest to, and that is the onboarding journey. Um, so anyone who is first, you know, going to a bank, starting a bank account, or downloading a banking uh, app, or any sort of app, the first thing you're going to want to do is onboard yourself into that journey. Um, we were very particular about ensuring what we built when it came to onboarding was simple and quick that could solve the pain points that our customers were having with opening up bank accounts, especially in this region. And um, I say this region for the people here from the UAE, opening up a bank account is not easy. <laughs> um, and uh, there's a lot of different you know, things that we have to go through in order to open up a bank account, let alone this in-person interview and uh, what well, seems to be like an interview when you are first starting to open up a bank account. Uh, I know in a lot of other uh, regions, especially those who are joining from Europe, UK, opening up a bank account, snap of the finger, um, especially with a lot of the fintechs that are out there. Um, but it, is not, it isn't the most easiest uh, journey that people go through. Um, and so we really, really agonized over this journey. And even to date, we're always looking at improving it, even though we haven't even gone on yet. Um, but this is a journey that um, our research showed us that was a pain point 
for so many users to go through. Um, people will stick with the bank they are with, even if they're unhappy, because the idea of trying to go and open up a new bank account with a new bank is horrifying. And I don't know how many of you can agree with that statement, but I definitely can attest to it. And no, there's no need to mention which banks we bank with. Um, but yeah, so what you see here were some of the gains we wanted to ensure that our users achieved when onboarding with Yahoo. Um, so again, thinking about the pains, what were those gains? So um, we wanted to make sure that people can sign up in less than 30 seconds and get a preliminary identity. We wanted to ensure that people would be able to validate themselves by simply scanning their Emirates ID and nothing else. Execute. Um, there were a lot of fights along the way, a lot of pushes, but um, you know, we were able to do it. And if you end up joining Yap in the future, um, you can test this out and let me know how it went for you. Um, but just a quick little animation I have here just to quickly show you a sneak peek of how um, this might look. So you start off, you enter your mobile number, um, you're gonna get OTP'd, you're gonna be asked to create a passcode, you're going to be asked to let us know your name so that we can address you by your name. And of course your email address so that we can send you information that you need. And voila, um, in hopefully less than 30 seconds and we actually find this, you would be able to get an account set up with an IBAN, uh, preliminary IBAN. Um, and the next steps would be that we would validate you with Emirates ID and deliver the card to you to fully activate it. So very quick, very easy, and hopefully um, we will be implementing this in a few, uh, I don't know how long, but very soon when we do go live um, for you guys. So, um, of course, there's many other journeys that we went through sort of with a similar process of understanding pains and gains. And, you know, when it comes to banking, there are so many different journeys that we can think about. Here is just a bunch of them that we that we definitely have within our app. Of course, there's a lot more other things. I'm not gonna go through every journey and what we did for every one of them. Um, that's something that we can go through maybe later on when the app is live and I can talk to you about everything. Um, but there is one other, one journey that I will speak to you about right now and that is card controls because I think it's something that we can all sort of understand um, and something that we all um, can sort of at least imagine and, and relate to. Sorry, not so, before you yeah, do. Yeah, you have questions, okay. <laughs> Yeah, um, I can see them coming, yeah. <laughs> that's okay. Um, were there any concerns before the onboarding around customer decision-making to use Yap? Yeah, so I, again, I'm not going through right now the full, I'm not going through right now for the full, um, sorry, I think I've just, just give me one second. I think my, my computer or something is happening to it. Can you still see my screen? Yeah, okay. yep, we can sorry, see. I think I was just uh, going on sleep mode. Okay, yeah, so um, there, were, there are definitely concerns when it comes to acquisition, customer acquisition, and I'm not going through the full journey that involves how do we acquire customers, how do we market to customers, how do we talk to customers and educate them about actually needing a, an app like, yeah, of course, those are things that we're thinking about, and we have an amazing marketing team that's working on that. Um, um, when I think of the end-to-end -end customer journey, this is not something I'm talking about right now, but we have built uh, customer journey maps that I'm not actually going to be speaking about in this presentation that do look at the full customer journey from, um, from awareness up until building loyalty um, into our app. So definitely it's something that we think about and where we have in place, but it's, I just haven't mentioned it right now in this presentation. I don't know, does that answer the question? It does. It does. Yeah. Um, the other question. So uh, someone just asked, we, we like our meetups to uh, be interactive. That's why we're not saving our questions for the end. Um, sorry if it's disturbing the flow or anything. But, no, it's okay. Uh, it's okay. It, 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 uh, yeah, cool. So the other question was, where is the KYC process in recruiting customers? Where is the fraud check? Know your customer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the KYC process um, is 
uh, our, the Emirates ID in this region, this is what we need to collect from our users. So after you sign up, there will be a next slide, which I didn't show you guys, but it's where you would give us your Emirates ID to validate you. And everything is happening on the back end in terms of validating the Emirates ID. So from a customer's perspective, it's very simple. All they need to do is give us Emirates ID and we do all the checks that happen on the back end side of things. Um, so yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, keep mm -hmm. going. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, cool. Okay, so I was going to get into another journey that I wanted to talk to you guys about, and that's card controls. Now, have you guys ever lost your debit card, your credit card? Have you ever misplaced it and wondered what to do? Well, the first thing many of us would want to do is, of course, call our banks and report the card lost or stolen. So during our research and talking to the banking, to banking consumers in the UAE, one of the things that we found out is that users actually think twice before calling their banks to complain about lost or stolen cards. And this is typically because of a bad experience they have had or heard their friends have had. What happens is if you call your bank and report your card lost or stolen, automatically you're blocked, period. You have no more access to pulling cash, making payments online, forget about Apple ID, your card is blocked. Now, now, um, this, if your card was truly stolen, you know, that's kind of okay because of course you're worried about fraud, you're worried about your security. But if it's just misplaced, if you forgot it in the office, if you left it in a restaurant, if it's under the bed somewhere, it starts to pose a problem as soon as it gets back into your hands. Um, and that, and from the painful experiences we heard our users tell us was that sometimes it could take up to a week to get a new card issued um, and delivered to them. And especially if this happens over holidays, like we know in the UAE, sometimes we have eight holidays that mean that, you know, banks are closed for like a whole week or, you know, God forbid, um, you're traveling. Um, so how are you going to get that card in your hand and how would it be activated? So, yeah, so this was an experience, a pain point that we heard a lot of people talk to us about when it came to, um, you know, reporting cards lost or stolen or, you know, just having them be misplaced. And another thing I'm just going to point out here, because I know there's probably a lot of people thinking, no, but your security is very important. Yes, of course, security is important. If you've lost your card, definitely you need to report it lost or stolen. But um, in the UAE, a lot of us have a little bit, are a little bit more easy on like worrying about somebody stealing our card. Um, and at least this is what came out of user research as well. So, um, you know, it's probably just misplaced. If I left it in the taxi, I wouldn't have to worry to go ahead and cancel it. I just want my card back. So we noticed that there was a pain here. Um, and, you know, this is really an easy fix. And I know a lot of banks are, are doing this because it's not just a FinTech thing. All banks should be allowing users to easily freeze or block their cards within the app but it's just people don't actually know that you can do that so um, what they end up doing is calling the call center clicking on yes report card lost or stolen and there you go your card is now being blocked so what we found is that we needed to sort of help with this pain and so some of the gains that we thought about about creating here is allowing customers to have full control over their card usage so if you want to block your card from being used online, you should be able to do it. If you want to block your card from being used abroad, you should be able to do it. If you want to freeze your card in total and not have it be used at all for whatever reason, you should be able to do it. And this needs to be seamless, it needs to be easy, it needs to be quick, and it needs to be in the hands of the customer. So, Sorry, just a super quick little technical question. Yeah. Um, why wasn't the UAE pass used and a few other banks are using that for some of their journeys? Yeah, so um, uh, we will be using UAE pass actually. So it, it's something that we are looking at integrating at the moment. Like I mentioned to you guys, when it comes to our onboarding process, it was an agonizing, it's something that we agonize always. We're always thinking about our onboarding. How can we make it the easiest, most possible way, right? So. The easiest way that we sort of developed without thinking about UAE Pass was simply getting an Emirates ID. But UAE Pass, definitely we know that it's in the future and probably now even more so in the near future with everything that's happening is going to, everyone is going to have to have UAE Pass set up. Um, so for those of us, for those of you who are not from the UAE, UAE Pass is basically an application that you can um, go to um, download and uh, set up with your Emirates ID and then you have to visit a, a 
physical kiosk somewhere in the UAE to activate it. And then if you have a fully activated UAE pass, you'll be able to um, validate yourself when it comes to banking and other sort of uh, government services within, uh, within the country. So it's definitely something we're thinking about. It'll definitely be available through our app as well for validation purposes. Um, and it's something that we're working on integrating for sure. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, great. Um, great. And um, I think somebody answered somebody else's question. So I think we're oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I think some of my colleagues are here. So maybe they'll start answering great. some of the questions. <laughs> Sorry, keep going. Um, okay. So I was talking to you guys about controls, right? So. Um, so basically, um, we want to be able to make it as easy as possible for you to control your card. And this was one of the gains that we had. So if you look at the screen here, just quickly showing you guys how we were able to do that. Just with a quick a click of a button and some toggles, you're able to set your limits um, and determine whether or not your card can be used at an ATM or online payments or a POS or abroad. Um, with a click of a button, a freeze card, you're able to freeze your card um, in case you've misplaced it or in case you know, you're traveling and you want to make sure that this card that's with me, if I do lose it, it's frozen, I have nothing to worry about. So there was a lot of these sort of games that we were able to sort of incorporate directly into card controls um, within uh, within our app. So again, um, there's a lot of journeys that we were working through and we use this process. So what I'm trying to get at you guys here is not specifically the journeys, but the process of finding pains and solving them and trying to win with games by incorporating different features and functionalities and a really nice experience within the app. So yeah, I'm not gonna go into any more of those journeys, but we have a lot of others that we've sort of um, implemented in a similar way. Um, and uh, hopefully really soon, if you do join the app, you'll be able to see them all and uh, give us your feedback on them. Um, but what I do wanna also talk to you guys about, because it's, I think it's extremely important for all products that are being developed to have a set of experience principles, is that you create these, these principles um, they get agreed upon uh, by the business. And um, for us, it was really from the start of the UX. When I first started working with Yap, this is one of the things that we, we did right away, um, had experience principles that were in place, that were signed off by leadership and, um, and uh, used and reused throughout our, all the different products and services that we're, where we're designing for our, for our product. So what are they? We have four principles um, and they're broad general statements, but then I'll give you some examples of how we apply them. So simple and effortless is one of them. As a digital banking application, we're going to be dealing with a lot of technical transactions. So these banking transactions, they need to be simple, both for customers and businesses um, to complete effortlessly and efficiently. Technical and business related content will still exist, but the process of understanding it needs to be as simple as possible. So you'll really see this experience principle of ours shine in the most simple onboarding process that we've been trying to create, also in the content and the visual that we have and in the delightful moments that we've tried to incorporate across the app. The second one is tailored and personalized, okay? So actually our tagline is the personalized banking app. And for us, personalization is extremely important. We actually have a full-on data center in place and someone really smart uh, in our team that is taking care of all the data. She's on this call, Victoria. Um, and um, really what we're trying to do is ensure that we capture the right information about our customers at the right time in order to expose content and information that matters to our customers. But also in the experiences that we're designing, we want to be able to acknowledge people's individuality. And we want the experience to feel anything but generic. So as much as we can refer to you by your name, as much as we can show you features that mean something to you, your financial sort of status that means something to you, visualizing it in a way we've tried to incorporate into, this, uh, into the app. Um, and you know, you'll see this a lot with how we identify users, how we deliver relevant content to them, how we augment the experience with personalized data that will be meaningful. Um, we will personalize based on user preferences wherever we can, and we wanna be able to aid in decision-making where needed as well. And this goes back earlier to this, that innovation question that we have. 
data is at the center of innovation. So really being able to know as much about our customers as possible without being too creepy, of course, um, would really help us start to provide those innovative experiences for our users within, within a product like, uh, yeah. Um, and the third experience is, uh, principle that we have is human. Now, this is also very important for us because we're a mobile only banking app, meaning we have no retail branches. There is no face to face interaction. So we really had to work extra hard to think about ways that will still make the app feel human to our users. So we're doing this in many ways. One way is through the UX content. Um, and the interactions that users will have on all our customer channels and touch points. We place a lot of effort on content. And again, uh, we have an amazing person in our team that's really working on content to really make sure that it's not just, con not just content that we're designing, but it's user experience content that we're placing at every touch point um, within the app. We try to replace technical jargon with meaningful content throughout the app. We give guidance to simplify the process where the processes have more complexity. And also we incorporated in-app live chats um, for our customer service, as well as WhatsApp chat directly accessible from the app. Um, and yes, we do have a customer service call center that will be available to our customers who still prefer calling in. So that, and that's sort of like one of our offline customer touch points that also has to employ all the experience principles that I, I mentioned as well. And the final experience principle that we have is scalable and adaptable. So this refers to ensuring that our solutions that we build are fit for future improvements and developments. One of the things that we always boast is that we're always gonna be in beta. No matter how, lo how many years we're gonna go be live, our mindset is to always be in this permanent beta, where we're always looking at how we can scale our product, how we can adapt it to different marketing efforts, to different needs, to different innovations, to sort of build this long lasting lively product. Um, and we, really, we do this by ensuring that there's a solid definition of the role of each section of the modules of the application. And our development team, we've been working so closely with them to build this. Um, it's not just here you guys, here's the UX, here's the UI, developers will develop. No, they are, we're working like hand in hand with our tech team to understand the functional specifications, to build a really robust um, back end system that is um, going to really change the way uh, banking works and be able to allow us to release new features really, really quickly as well. Um, so that had to be an experience principle because it was, it's part of the main offering as a company and as a product that we need to have in place and the organization of course must uh, also support that too. So these are, these are our main real uh, experience principles that we've sort of created that are in place, it's known sort of by everybody um, and we employ within our product um, development uh, process. You Any questions quick, right now? Great question. Okay. Um, Greta's excited. I know she's a content UX uh, uh -huh. writer. Um, yeah. Tell us more about the human content. Do you have mm -hmm. a dedicated writer? And where yes, were the yeah. biggest challenges you faced to find uh -huh. a good balance between banking terms and human speak? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. And I think, you know, Jonathan, I think it would be actually great for one day to have a session just on UX writing and UX content writing. Um, I am nominating because... Greta. She is here. Um, <laughs> yeah. We, and we Greta, you should speakers. definitely meet Melissa, who's part of our team, because she's completely on it. One of the things that we had to do when it came to content is have it be part of sort of the UX experience from the start. Okay, so yes, we have a tone of voice and we need to understand sort of the brand and the tone of voice that needs to be in place. But the UX content uh, writer, I call her UX content writer because she's part of the UX team, in my opinion. She has been involved at every stage of understanding the product and probably knows this product more than anybody inside out because of all of this sort of writing that she's had to do in terms of the product. Um, the UX content person is involved in UX design, is involved at the user, inter, uh, user, user interface design stage, is involved in the product uh, functional specification stage, and is involved in the technical development stage. So having this UX writer be part of every stage of developing this product is what helped us ensure that the writing um, was always going to have sort of this human-centric voice to it. 
um, just to think about banking. You know, the next time you do sort of a bank transfer on your banking application, um, and it's like, for example, um, after two hours, you're going to have some message that tells you something about your uh, transfer not going to be sent on so-and-so date. How do you sort of explain that to somebody in a nice human way? Even down to these granular little content pieces, our UX content writer is involved. Um, how does she create this humanized voice? I'm going to have to like let her sort of speak to that because um, she really um, understands our customers. She's part of the user research. She's part of understanding the persona. She was there when we were writing the persona. So she knows who our users are. She knows what sort of the, the sort of the content feel that our organization is trying to push out. And that's really what I believe has helped us write this, this you know, create this human sort of content into, into our app. I don't know if that answers your question completely. It does. But, um, uh, we got a great, great yeah. uh, response there from Greta. Very happy with the answer. Okay, Thank great. you. <laughs> Great, great. Okay, um, anything else? Yeah, we just had one pop in. Yeah. Um, are there any compliance and regulations that need to be followed from the government and how does this affect the experience? <laughs> of course, of course, guys. Compliance and regulations is so important when it comes to any fintech and banking and and I'm sure all the bankers here in the room uh, or in the Zoom can, can attest to that. Look, uh, we have a compliance team, IAP as well, that is, again, part of the product design process. Okay, so everything that we do in terms of, you know, sending money, um, you know, especially like sort of the, any money that leaves the uh, account or enters the account or creating accounts and creating, setting up accounts, it involves compliance um, and we have to follow regulations by central banks to ensure that we're going to be able to go live right so uh, it is completely part of our product um, design uh, process and um, yeah I mean there's yeah it's it's there we think about it we it's part of everything that we do um, we have to get everything vetted by them before we go live um, so yes we do think about it <laughs> that answers your question <laughs> Yeah, sorry, we just got another um, question. Yeah. Um, many of your features are similar to those of other challenger banks in the UK. Yeah. Which suggests yeah. the research has revealed similar pains in both countries. Do you find yeah. any UAE specific insights or pain points? Mm -hmm. Great question. Yes, definitely a great question. Look, yes, a lot of what we're going to be doing at is going to match to what a lot of the fintechs uh, globally are doing as well because yes you're right we share a lot of the pain points regardless of which region you are in the world right um, that might change a lot for us you know if you think of other regions around the world that are just sort of new to banking and things like that but especially for our more developed countries we're probably going to have a lot of similar pain points um, what we have been doing at YAP and I think I'm, I'm allowed to talk about this because um, it is on our, our website, is that we're going to be offering um, services in uh, what I like to call sort of a marketplace that we have within, uh, within Yap, it's called the Yap Store, where we design specific products that solve problems for people within the region that we're in. So one of the products is a uh, product that will be available to young uh, young. Uh, people. So um, uh, within the UAE, if you're not at the age of 18, you can actually start a bank account. So you're actually either using your parents' debit cards, you might have like a simple spare card that your parents issue to you and they're able to put into the hands of their youngsters. Um, but we've worked on developing a uh, product that is specific to parents here within the UAE in which they can issue cards for their uh, children. Um, and be able to teach them about financial uh, uh, financial spending, um, be able to allow them to understand how to save money, how to spend money smartly. Um, so it's a product that we'll be working on, and we are actually working on, and hopefully we'll be ready to release as well with the with the, uh, the second version of the app. The other product that we've been also thinking a lot about has to, has to do a lot with financial inclusion. In our region, um, not anybody can open up a bank account, unfortunately. You have to have a certain salary. You have to, um, so you have to make a certain salary um, to be able to open up a bank account. 
and this ends up excluding a lot of people in the region, in this country specifically, from actually having access to a bank account. So, um, and those people specifically could be people who are part of your household uh, help and your household staff. So uh, another product that we're also uh, will be releasing specific to our region is a household card for families in the UAE to issue to their nannies, to their drivers, to their, you know, to anyone that works within their within their household um, that man that they either pay a salary to or helps them manage their expenses. This, these are the first two products that we're coming up with. Um, from the business side of things, we're also looking at different things that a lot of SME, uh, FinTech SMEs are also offering things like expense cards and payroll cards. Um, but also just the point on that is that there are other things that we're thinking about I can't say right now, but we actually have a lot of other sort of very focused products uh, that are focused on our region, but it's right now in the testing and validation stages of research to really know if we're going to take them to that, to that level. But yeah, um, our sort of uh, idea is always, yes, we think globally, but we want to be acting locally and offering services and features specific to our local markets as well. Awesome. Keep going. Thank you. Okay, so my next slide, I'm just wrapping up here. I'm going to take, take you guys to my summary. Um, so the most important pieces of our toolkit um, that I've been speaking to you guys about um, are, the, are the following. But of course, it doesn't mean that we haven't uh, used any other US techniques, you know, that I didn't mention, you know, so sketching and wireframing and building design systems and benchmarking and testing, all of those are things that we're also doing. But these are the things I wanted to talk to you about because from my perspective, I felt they were very important in helping us get to a product that is human-centered. So to recap, the, number, the first thing is having a collaborative product design team. Uh, I'll say it again, uh, collaboration is the key to successful product design work, without a doubt. Ensuring that you're able to work in cross-functional teams from strategy, marketing, product design, development is essential in releasing stronger and better products. Knowing your customer, this is where research comes in. You have to speak to your customers. You have to know them inside out. You have to build intimate relationships. Um, so important, especially in banking. Don't just pose it on your own experiences with banking and, and think, okay, well, I'm a customer and I can sort of build this based on, on what we're doing. Um, you know, really try to get up there, understand your customers. That's the only way you're going to be able to really understand some of the innovative products that we're able to build. Like I mentioned to you guys about household or, you know, the young sort of product that we built. It didn't come from my experiences. I don't have any children. I don't, I don't have any, hire any household help. So it was really important to be able to speak to families and understand what are some of those pain points that we can, that we know that they go through so that we can think about creating innovative products for them. And thirdly, um, our user profile canvas. Um, really, that was a very, it's a very uh, cool technique for us because it helps us really understand the extent of our journeys, the transactions and the tasks that need to be part of our app. It helps us go into in-depth task analysis and design around pains and gains, um, which is really essential in the design of our product. And finally, as we were just speaking about the experience principles that really help guide the way um, to our product delivery across the business. Um, I also wanted to leave you guys with some recommendations if you wanted to sort of go through a little bit more um, into and delve more into some of the stuff that we've been talking about. Oh, first of all is a book that's called Digital Human. I actually have it here with me. Um, this is a book that's written by a guy called Chris Skinner, and he also heads up a really cool agency called 11FS. Uh, for those in the fintech arena, definitely look them up if you don't know them already. There's amazing podcasts that they have that can really help you understand everything that's happening um, in the fintech space. Um, but he wrote this book called Digital Human, The Fourth Revolution That Humanity Includes Everyone. I'm just going to read one little quote out of the book, so just to give you an understanding of what it offers. Um, in Digital Human, Chris Skinner challenges our notion of what it will mean to be human and the role that money and finance will play. With, with this follow-up to Digital Bay, which is another book that he's written, Skinner paints a picture of humanity's digital future, and the future is bright. As he describes, with 7.5 billion people connected in real time through mobile technology, Increased access and transparency have the potential to finally tear down the walls of financial inclusion. exclusion. So really good book that I would recommend you guys look into. The second one is this one here that I have and it's on collaborative product design. 
written by Austin Gavella. And this is a really great one for anyone that's working in, uh, in bigger teams um, or even more cross-functional teams that really wants to understand new techniques of how to get everyone together to uh, come up with ideas and get them on board with understanding their customers, their tasks, and how to build sort of some of those um, uh, sort of design thinking principles into your teams. And the last thing I just wanted to reiterate the uh, recommendation for the use of Miro. Um, obviously, I have no affiliation to them. I just use the product and think it's amazing. And I found it very, very useful during this time when we're working from home and trying to sort of, um, you know, brainstorm and put up, you know, our post notes that we typically like to do in the office. Uh, Miro is a great place to do it. And there's a collaboration element where you can get all your team together um, and use it. So definitely look it up and there's a free trial as well. So those are some of the recommendations I have, but um, before I take any more questions, I just wanted to um, just remind you guys uh, of this product that I've been working on, this company. Uh, um, if you're interested, and I know there's a lot of UX people here, so I'd love to get you guys on board. If you're interested in being part of our beta team, just get in touch with me. You can connect with me on LinkedIn. Um, or our website will be up soon. We just took it down this past week because we were just doing some changes to it, but you can actually just sign up directly on the website to um, get on the first list of users to test the app, and hopefully you can give us back some really great feedback for us to continuously improve it. Um, so I hope, uh, I hope everyone that this was beneficial to you guys. Um, and if you have any more questions, I can take them right now. But thank you so much for everyone who stayed this long. And uh, I hope that was uh, informative. And yeah, any other questions, I can take them now. Otherwise, we can stop there. Um, yeah, a couple of uh, quick questions. Uh, mm -hmm. Can you virtually send some drinks and snacks to everyone? That was. Uh, <laughs> You probably guess who that was, a friend Assad. Um, can, is the presentation able to be made uh, public? Can you share that? I mean, we're, we're, we're happy to share the recording, right? So. Yeah, um, I think it should or, be fine. I mean, we have the recording, so that should be, be there. Recording. But yeah, let, me just, enough, let me just right? confirm things with, with the app, but it should, okay. I think it should be fine, yeah. Is there, are you aware of Chris Skinner's blog or website? Hmm. Yeah, it, um, I, I follow 11FS, so that's the one, uh, he's part of the 11FS group, so um, okay. they have, do you, do you want me to give you the blog, is that, is that what you guys are yeah, asking Yeah, maybe for? if you can, just, yeah, someone's just, after, yeah, you can I, put I, into the I chat. Can, yeah, I can get it put in the chat, but if you just Google 11FS, you'll find everything there, or okay. even just Google yeah, his name. Someone Honestly, else there, found it and yeah. shared it, oh, okay. 11FS.com, nice, nice. brilliant. <laughs> yeah. Um, but look up their blog and look up their podcast. They also have a podcast. They just released a podcast uh, like few two weeks ago about uh, fintech and marketing. So for all the marketeers out there in the fintech space or the banking space, um, that would also be a really cool uh, podcast for you guys to listen to. Awesome. Is there any other questions, thoughts? I had a few curveball questions, but I didn't want to be mean to you, Nada. <laughs> <laughs> um, one person just asked if you don't mind going back to the book slide. Oh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. I know it's not going back. Hold on. No. There we go. Yeah. Okay, awesome. I did, I did, uh, What are the plans for the future of Yap? How you plan mm -hmm. to track the actual user experience? It's a good question. Metrics. Um, yeah. So, like I said to you guys, we have um, we have a whole data center um, that's being uh, built within our company, um, and someone specific that is actually looking up, you know, taking care of data within the organization. So we have a lot of really cool tools that we have already integrated that will help us with understanding users' behaviors within um, within uh, the usage of the of the product itself. Uh, customer experience uh, is also part of uh, what I work on at Yap. So we are going to be tracking end-to-end -end journey of our customers from the moment they log in to the moment they log out, understanding their journeys, understanding how they use the app, where the, so the, 
where the problems ex are, where the drop offs are, off, what are not working, what people are liking. So we have analytics in place that's going to be doing that. Um, and it's already been built in. Um, we also will be continuously uh, employing the user research um, uh, techniques that I mentioned to you guys earlier. So we will be having um, customers come in, doing one-on-one -on -one interviews with them, user usability testing. It can be part of something that we'll be doing regularly, um, and we'll have someone be focused specifically on that within the organization. So um, it is something that will be part of everything that we do um, to ensure that we're understanding how customers are interacting with the app, how we can continue uh, building and fixing it and making sure that it works um, as we intend for it to work or as for, I should say, as our customers intend for it to work. Okay, great. Um, a few other questions. Uh, assuming YAP, is oh it's great that was actually i think i've read ahead it, it, it's where i was getting at um assuming app is targeted at a couple of different user segments how many users did you interview per segment and how did you prioritize the pains gains and jobs to be done is one segment pains more important than another um, if, I could, so, if you just just pause yeah. for a second what i was going to yeah. ask you on jobs to be done have you used that methodology how you feel about that versus personas or versus um, that the workflow that you showed. Mm -hmm. So just to mix um, it all up in there. <laughs> so yeah, so look, we, we sort of employ a lot of different techniques when we're looking at user research um, and sort of understanding our customers. So when we went out to sort of uh, interview uh, users, we kind of just tried to get as many people as we can to interview them. Um, and obviously we had specific people in mind, like for example, within the UAE, the first way to sort of think about it is think about demographics. So, you know, we wanted to make sure we talked to some Emirati uh, locals, we wanted to make sure we talked to Western ex uh, expats, families, non-families, small businesses. So really just as a broad uh, sort of selection of different types of customers based on the demographics of the region that we're in. That was sort of the first kind of step that we took to, you know, sort of interviewing different types of people. From the results that we got, we were able to then synthesize and understand who are the type of customers that we have. And also, obviously, like, we also had in mind what are we, what is the product that we're trying to build. And we sort of also knew uh, initially from um, the business strategy of who uh, we were trying to make sure who we were trying to target this product to initially. I mean, especially when it came to sort of the regional sort of products that we're offering that are focused a lot on families. Um, so, you know, we knew that we had those type of people in mind as well that we were building for. Um, so, yeah, so you, so we kind of just went out there based on demographics and also the targeted audiences that we knew as a business that we're trying to reach. And then based on the results, we synthesized them. We try to then pick out what we get out of there. What are stuff that are common themes that we're listening to and hearing about um, that can help us then build um, customer journey maps and, you know, understand sort of user task analysis and things like that. And the personas is just a tool that we have placed uh, that we have placed, but it doesn't mean that we're not using other tools to sort of understand um, what are the different things that we're trying to get um, from our customers, the different jobs that they're trying to complete, as you as you mentioned, the jobs getting done sort of technique. Um, but yeah, it's it's just, you know, it's going through so much results from different research and synthesizing them is and making use of them in a way that's meaningful to us to help us understand the techniques and the features and the journeys that we're trying to trying to design. And it's an ongoing process. Cool. We've clearly drawn uh a very different crowd not of than the usual mm -hmm. um a lot of banking questions but mm -hmm. uh yeah so feel free if, if uh um yeah if it's not quite uh your alley maybe we can have somebody else jump in who who knows the answer yeah. to this um i'll go go ahead anyway what are your thoughts and vision on blockchain and decentralized data and the mm -hmm. future of also the future of privacy yeah. Okay, that's a lot of questions in there. Um, but let me start with blockchain. Um, and I'm not a blockchain expert, but I, what I do know is that blockchain is going to be important 
so important for fintechs and for banking, especially when we think about open banking. Um, how are we going to be able to get information passed through and, and uh, secured and all that sort of stuff? I believe blockchain will be one of the ways that will help us get there. I can't speak too much about it because like I said, I'm not an expert at it. I'm trying to get my head wrapped around it anyways. Um, obviously we have people within the organization that, are, um, that can speak better at it, uh, but it is something that we're keep uh, very much in mind and we do know that we will be using it as soon as we can, especially, especially when it comes to transferring money. So one of the things that you think about when it comes to like remittances or sending money um, right now um, for the bankers in the room, we know that this is happening across, you know, different systems like SWIFT and things like that, which um, doesn't give really good transparency as to where your money is during a transfer. And hopefully blockchain will be able to solve a lot of those issues. So I do see blockchain being a very integral part of, of um, future of banking. Uh, in general, whether it's Fintechs or the big banks. Um, and it's something that we are definitely keeping in mind. What was the second part of that question? The privacy issues, right? It was, yeah, the future of privacy and yeah. decentralized data. Yeah. So, um, yeah, again, I mean, again, obviously, uh, info security when it comes to banking is extremely important. Um, so if you're thinking about securing people's accounts and their information, and their accounts, that is something that is, is always going to be part of banking, it's always going to be important. What are my thoughts about it? My thoughts are, it's important. I don't know what to say when it comes to that. Um, but uh, yeah, we do have people in the organization that are focused specifically on this. Space. So I, I don't want to talk too much about it, because I'm not an expert yeah. in those areas. But cool, cool. I do know, obviously, we are very much, we do have people who very much live and breathe that and that's part of, um, that does, you know, it does impact our product design as well. And that's when I said to, to you guys earlier, when we have um, the compliance and the regulations people within our organization, they have to be part of our product design because, uh, process because they will be the ones who have those answers and they need to ensure that we are doing everything as per regulations as well. Cool. Uh, the next one was on your map slide, um, someone saw live. Yeah. Yeah. So live from so it's, it's NBD. I mean, I, I wanted to post live up there because I think in this region, um, it's probably the closest one that we have that can be considered, um, you know, FinTech or challenger banks, um, even though it's part of a bigger bank, it doesn't mean that it's not a FinTech. It is. So it is just, it is one of the ones that are out there and, and FinTechs, um, are allowed to be part of other banks. That does not make them, that doesn't make them non-fintechs. Um, they're using financial technology to provide their services, but they might be part of another bank in terms of their banking license. So, um, yeah, so uh, it, it's, they still act as fintechs. And um, I mean, I don't know much about Live, I don't know, I don't work for Live or know anything about internally how they do things. But my assumption is they probably have they have been able to get a lot of stuff out there, so they probably have a more decentralized way of designing their product. Sure. So the the specifically they were after. So Live from Emirates NBD does offer a just online account for students, and all but that's associated with NBD, right? Will YAP associate to an existing bank in the future, or is it a new standalone mm -hmm. fintech yeah. service? I will answer that question for you guys soon. I can't answer it right now, um, but you'll know everything about the way sort of the structure of the of YAP is. And, um, you know, yes, obviously we have a license to operate, of course, otherwise we wouldn't be able to go live in the UAE, uh, but all the sort of details of the licensing Can you hear me? Yes, I seem to have connection seems to not be great. Um, a few more okay. questions. That you, you, okay, can, you can hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, cool. Um, if the project goes live, how a challenger bank differentiate themselves from incumbent banks can easily have a seamless onboarding experience. I mean, the fact is they don't and they change very slowly, right? So I think <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, a lot of thank yous. Is Yap a bank? 
<laughs> that's interesting. <laughs> Um, that's a very, yeah, I mean, no, we don't, I mean, yes and no. Do we really want to call ourselves a bank or do we want to be known as a fintech? I mean, I don't want to really answer that question, but if we could be a bank, we could not be a bank. I, I don't know how to answer that question for you, but technically we do have a banking license. So we are functioning um, uh, with a lot of banking uh, services. We don't offer the full fledge of banking services just yet. And I don't know if we want to, but we are offering specific services to specific target audiences in the fintech space. Um, and yeah, hopefully you'll be able to experience that very soon. Did COVID affect the app at all? Well, it did affect us because we were meant to go live this month. I mean, I was yeah, hoping that by that the time you. that I, that I was doing this presentation, I'd be live and, and we would be able to show you a lot more. Um, so yeah, we have had to, um, just slow down the release of the app for many different reasons. Um, but that's okay. Um, everything happens for a reason. And hopefully soon, um, when things sort of quiet down and it makes sense for us to go to market, um, we will be. And trust me, it will be soon because we're ready and we are excited and we want to get out there. We've been doing working on this for a long time. So it will be very, very soon. Um, there's another question. So just to follow up on that is how are you doing user testing interviews given the lockdown they start this uh company started doing remote moderated testing now because yeah. of covid just wondering if there are any yeah. other ways i mean uh i'm happy to take it after you uh yeah maybe I'll add um, on maybe maybe you could add to that because actually i haven't been doing any testing the past few weeks just yet um, we've been focused on a lot of other things at the moment that we uh, are trying to do in terms of ensuring that uh, the app is ready for release. So we haven't actually gone to the testing stage uh, just yet in the past uh, few weeks during the lockdown stage. Uh, we're probably going to have to think about that very soon if this is going to continue um, as long as it, you know, who knows how long. But um, if it does continue long, we will have to look at ways of testing online. And I know a lot of organizations have been doing it. So, you know, just as I'm doing this sort of Zoom call with you, I'm sure we can sort of manage something. But maybe, Jonathan, you can sort of tell us what you guys have been doing. Yeah, I might just uh, stop your screen share. It's the advantage of sure. having um, and just Both share my, my screen. <laughs> yeah. No, just. It, it's cool to uh, and look sorry guys but we might just kind of end it there um and uh yeah let's just let um so just before i joined um property finder uh i've been working for about a year on the side with a startup and I did an evaluation for doing unmoderated testing. So that's where you do either usability or any sort of testing that you are not participating in, that you are, um, you know, creating the questions and then the system can just go next, next, next. Um, and uh, you don't have to be there. It's a huge advantage, right? So you can speak to people anywhere in the world. And um, then when the results are done, you can just watch that. So in that evaluation, the, I did a few uh, trials, live trials with uh, the product for the startup. And by far, in you know, my opinion, usertesting.com is a great tool, um, but it is very expensive and you have to pay for it annually. So the next best option, which is something we are using at Property Finder, is a tool called User Feel. Um, and again, and they do have a database for uh, the region for Dubai, it's not a huge database. So the cost includes both the incentive for the uh, participant as well as the cost of the software. Um, and we've, we've done that, um, it's, it's not bad, but also for moderated testing, um, either Zoom, but the challenge with Zoom is if you're testing on mobile and it's, uh, it can be quite hard. So look back is the other um, tool that uh, I've, I've used both in Australia and recently and look back allows you with the app to test Android iOS or a mobile site um, and it's it's quite powerful um, yeah can be quite great the uh, okay. uh, just gonna sorry did you want to add anything nada no no that's that's great um, the other thing I just wanted to talk about kind of final thing was next month we've got a really great uh, talk on May 25th 
he's been very patient. Feel bad, Robert. We've kind of his poor guys moved around a few times. He's been in the region for quite a while. Uh, very experienced working at Tiger Spike at the moment, and he's got a great presentation. I've had a sneak peek around um, busting user research myths and misconceptions, and how to how do you counter those things in your uh, organization. So uh, would love to see everyone again, same channel. Um, and just huge thank you again to Nada. It was a really great uh, presentation. Um, and thanks to everyone for your questions. And uh, we hope to see you again next time. Is we'll, we'll try to make in the next few days the, uh, the video available. But if you've got any more questions, feel free to reach out to Nada or myself on uh, LinkedIn. We're, uh, we're happy to answer. And Greta, hopefully you're still on the call. We're uh, looking forward to your talk um, sometime soon, maybe a month after next, it would be great. <laughs> cool, thanks everyone. Thank you, Nada, it was really awesome. Great, thank you guys, thank you everyone for all the questions and I, I hope that it was beneficial to everybody. Yeah, it was awesome, thank you. Great, okay, bye-bye. Bye, bye. bye.